you know, there's a there's a point in your book where you talk about the BP oil spill in the Gulf of uh, Mexico, and and people that are you know they they wanted to ch- they're watching television and this these images come up of these animals that are dying and suffering as a result of this oil spill, and people just can't look at it. They don't want to look at it. They would rather look away. Um, but you you offer a way for us to to look at the the horror of it um, and kind of fit it within our understanding in a way that's actually leads us to a more healthy way of approaching it. And, and I think that you, you talk, you know, there's a quote that you, you have here from um, a gentleman named David Paulus. And, and he says, uh, the waste is an orphan from the circle of life. And when that, when it gets to that part of the book, which is near the beginning I think that that's really when the book takes on its character. Like you really realize like what you're trying to get to, which is that we look away from these places because again, they make us feel these feelings that we don't know how to, to grapple with or how to process. Um, yeah, Dave, it was actually David Paulus who started me off on this whole search. Yeah. I did, I did a video about him. Well, it's been more than 30 years ago now. And, and he taught, he talked about how he had received a grant from the very prestigious um, National Science Foundation to recycle steel waste. And at first he had gone up to this huge mound of steel waste and he saw it as a, as something to be conquered. But because he had grown up in a Nida family, he got back down to his car after getting samples of this, this steel waste and realized that's not the way to think about it at all. And so he made a prayer, tell me the right way created to think about this. And that was when it came to him, the waste is an orphan from the circle of life. And I just thought that was so beautiful and so profound uh, because it's a way of thinking about that which we put outside of our consciousness that we think we'd rather ignore, that it's bad, that it's ugly, that it's, it, it's, it's an eyesore, all of those things, rather than just looking at it and saying, this is part of the natural world, this is, this is part of humanity, this is part of the earth, this is part of life, um, not necessarily part of humanity, except that it's part of our hearts. And so how do I incorporate this? How do I see this in my mind as being a part of the earth? Mm, exactly. And, and I really thought that was quite a profound thing as viewing the waste as an orphan, as some, as a, as a, again, a part of the circle of, of life or the circle or the, you know, the whole wholeness of our planet and the wholeness of the life on this planet, but not having, uh, uh, I guess I could ask then, like, if we come to that recognition that, that the, the desolate places, the wasted places and the waste that comes from say industry or, or whatever it is, if, if we don't know how to uh, deal with it, uh, what's the next step? I mean, you know, it, it's one thing to, to then begin to acknowledge that it's an orphan, but, but how do we, how do we begin that journey of, of, I guess, healing from that? Yeah, well, that's, that's what I, t- that's what the subject of about two thirds of the book is. It's there. And they're what I began to think of them as they're really simple tools but typically, we don't think of them as tools that we use when we deal with the earth, with places, with nature. We typically think of them as, as things we use with people. So like one of them, one of the very first one is what I call gazing. You know, like you talked about the, the man who was having such a hard time looking at those those pelicans and dolphins that were just covered with oil. Um, it, the first step is to actually be willing to go to these places or look at these images and just let the feelings bubble out. And w- before we do that, we often think that they'll be so overwhelming that it'll just sweep us away. And what actually happens is that instead of being swept away and lost, it's like we come to a new grounding in ourselves. Uh, compassion opens up. And also we become aware that we can face things that we thought were gonna be too hard to face. And that's very empowering. So another one of these tools is getting to know these places as they are now. And that's why um, that I, I really am recommending, and my organization that I founded, which is also called Radical Joy for Hard Times, we recommend going to these places. Don't just look at pictures of them. Um, whenever you can, go to them, spend time in them, see what's going on in them. Ask your walk around, see what's trying to grow back. 
see what's beautiful in strange ways, in in uh, surprising ways, in heart moving ways. And then the the real essence of it is, um, well, the, and then they're sharing stories about our experiences there while we're there. And then the real um, sort of like the crux of it all is actually making a gift out of materials that you find on site and giving it back to the place. The place, all of these places in our lives and on the earth have given so much to animals and, and plant, other plants and waters and stones and the sky and the atmosphere. Now is our opportunity to give back to them in, in, in consolation for how hurt they are and in gratitude for all they've given. And, and we recommend giving these gifts out of materials that are already on site. So in other words, you don't have to be an artist. You don't have to haul in a lot of supplies. You don't have to organize people. You, know, you don't have to even plan in advance. It can be something that you just do spontaneously on the, in the moment for the place. And it's really, it's, it's surprisingly empowering and moving and beautiful. 